Good morning, everyone, and happy Thursday, and welcome to I Take Bravo Very Seriously with me, your host, Anna Mandel. I'm really excited to be here today because it's finally been a little bit slower of a week in the Bravo sphere, so I haven't felt like there's been any huge emergencies that I had to let you guys know about, so I felt like I've been able to relax and at the same time um, process all the information that we've gotten in the last week, which also means I've had a chance to really process uh, Rachel's lawsuit, go through it, and sort of form opinions on it, because as I told you guys last week when I gave you the emergency episode, I was just going to read it for now because I just wanted to get you guys the information, but I wasn't, you know, sure exactly how I felt about it yet, and I also wanted to just look into uh, the privacy rights and laws just to see what the merits were of um, the causes of action. So I'll definitely break that down a bit today in addition to our news of the week. Um, I won't be recapping Rachel Goes Rogue because she didn't release an episode. Um, I'm hoping that everything is okay. I'm assuming it was due to um, the backlash that she got last week um, when her lawsuit came out, or maybe it is because um, she's not allowed to talk anymore because she currently has a lawsuit going on. I'm not really sure, but there's been no episode, so nothing to recap there. And then I'm going to recap Summer House with you guys from last week, as well as Vanderpump Rules and the Vanderpump Rules After Show. So let's get into the episode. Oh and that's God, why you why go is it about on. the damn pasta? Get over the damn pasta, read between the f***ing lines. It ain't about the pasta. It's not about the pasta. It's not about the pasta. Okay, so in news of the week, Jax Taylor and Brittany Cartwright continue to go back and forth as to what the relationship status is in terms of the media. So literally since I last reported to you guys, which was on Friday, there's still been some mishmash. So I let you guys know last week that Brittany had confirmed on her podcast, When Reality Hits, um, which I believe was released last Wednesday or Thursday, um, that she and Jax were going to be living separately and she said to pray for them. So right after that, um, Jax was approached at the gym and actually had the clip. I'm going to play that for you guys now. How are you feeling, man? After the, how are you feeling after the breakup? Uh, I don't know, man. How do you guys know I was here? This is, a, this is a popular gym. Um, do you reckon, look, obviously there's, the fans are asking and thinking online that do you reckon there's going to be a chance of reconciliation at all? Oh, of course. I mean, this is not divorce. We're just taking okay. some time apart and just trying to reassess, you know, our, our situation. And, um, you know, we have a child involved and we just want to do what's best for our kid. It's extremely healthy yeah. and I, I really respect that. Um, and so do you reckon, I mean... Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, finally, you know, how's the new living arrangement? How you, how you live, how you guys like doing with that? Yeah, we're actually together. We're living in our home right now. Oh, lovely. Because there was a story that was online. She was in a, in a house for a while, but, uh, uh, yeah, she's, she's back now. We're, we're trying to figure it out. This is, this is all fresh and new. So, all right. So well, we're film together and whatnot. Well, yeah, yeah. It's not going to take apart. We're not, it's not evil nastiness. It's, it's just two people that, you know, are hitting a, a 10 year mark in their marriage and, you know, either go one way or the other. Okay, so first I love him saying, like, how did you find me when, like, I think a week prior he had just said on his podcast what new gym he had started going to, but anyways. Um, so he's saying here, he's literally, this is literally right after Brittany released her podcast, or When Reality Hits, their joint podcast, but he wasn't on the episode saying that they were living separately. Here he's saying, oh, no, 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 she's back in the house, we're, we're totally living together. So this was fr last Friday, and then on Saturday there were all these pictures and articles posted of Britney very clearly moving all of her stuff. Um, and then on the weekend, we uh, did get a quote from Britney. So a TMZ or a reporter stopped her and she gave a very long interview. So here's what Britney said. I'll play the clip for you now. It's Jack, so he's not really trying that much right now. So is there like plans for any marriage counseling? I mean, I've asked him for a while mm -hmm. to do certain things and nothing has come from that yet. So, okay. you know, I mean, hopefully, I mean, I'm, you know, we've been together for nine years now. So well, you're remaining hopeful. For yeah. The yeah. Okay. So I, no, I just got to ask a lot of people, you know, are saying that they think that this is a publicity stunt and it's to promote your upcoming, you know, spinoff series. I want to let you, you know, speak your side and, you know, share your side of it. Yeah. Is that yeah. the case? No, or absolutely is this not. This for your mental health? This is definitely for my mental health. Like. I think that's been the hardest, one of the hardest parts right now is that people are like speculating that I am doing something for the show coming out because actually, no, you know, uh, you know, whenever you fight with somebody for so long, there's only so much that you can take and you know, I deserve better, Cruz deserves better. We want like a good, 
co-parenting relationship and I think that me moving out and taking space to figure out if this is what I want is like the best situation for me right now. Do you at least think that in the end it'll be okay? Do you guys think you can pull through? Or? Listen, I love Jack so much. I really do. And I just want the best for me and for my son at this point. So that's like my main focus. Okay. Um, but for sure, if, you know, if he switches some things and changes some things about his life, then maybe we can get back together. But right now, it, I just, I don't know. I know your spin off The Valley is coming soon. <laughs> Will the cameras, you know, be on for, you know, this part of the separation or Looks are like you not going to? <laughs> I think like gradually people will be able to see like throughout the season why we end up where we are right now. Okay. Yeah. Well, lastly, I just got to know, are you guys still going to be doing the podcast? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, the podcast we, we are going to co-parent. We're going to make everything like we have businesses together. That's like very important. So, you know, podcast is still happening. Our bar is still happening. Show is still happening. It's just a lot going on right now. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. So first of all, we're not really sure what it is that Jax did to cause this rift, right? Like, I have some other content creators speculating that maybe it has something to do with Cruz. Um, a lot of people have noticed that they haven't seen him speak and that he could potentially be nonverbal and that this is something I talked about last week where possibly the strife between Bra Jax and Brittany could be about um, parenting where Brittany could be wanting to get him help. Um, and Jax may just be having that sort of old school male mentality of not wanting, you know, he's just fine and, and just give it time and he'll be fine. And so there could be some parenting strife. I, I mean, we all know how Jax is, right? Jax is a cheater. And so there's definitely speculation online that Jax has cheated. Um, a fan sent me a comment from Tammy Pascatelli, who's a comedian who said that, or she commented on like one of the Us Weekly articles or the TMZ or E! News, one of the articles about Jackson and Britney splitting, and she commented on the article saying, I heard that um, Jax told Britney that he wasn't attracted to her anymore, but this is just what I heard ever since she had the baby. I mean, that's totally something Jax would say. We've heard him say things about her body before. Um, if it was cheating, I don't think she would be open to a separation. I think that that would sort of be it. Um, so when she talks about like him changing his things in his life, like I'm curious as to what she means. I mean, he's definitely having a little bit of a different lifestyle right now with the bar and hanging out with the guys. And he had those appearances where he was in Montreal with Schwartz. So if that's sort of what he's referring to or she's referring to, then that totally makes sense. Um, but at the same time, like as much as I think that this is real because it clearly, they clearly are separating at the same time, what do you mean you guys are going to still do the podcast together? And what do you mean the show, right? Like it sort of did feel like regardless of ne both of them saying this isn't for the promotion of the show, she's also sort of said, oh, well, you'll, you'll see in the show, um, you know, I think she's sort of implying you'll see where the dissolution of our marriage sort of starts, which is fair, you know, these things don't happen overnight necessarily, but you know, she's making us do the sort of scandal where now we sort of want to watch and so to see if we can find any Easter eggs and clues to see what led to their current breakup. And the idea that you guys are going to do a podcast together when you keep saying that you're always fighting and there's only so much fighting you can have with one person, how the fuck are you guys going to be doing a podcast together? And isn't it just going to be uncomfortable for us? Like, like I just don't really know. So I don't know what's going on with them. Like, it's so confusing. And then um, the other night, Lala was on Watch What Happens Live. So I'm going to play the clip for her be uh, from her because Andy asks her about Jax and Brittany. That Jax and Brittany are separated. Were we surprised? What are we thinking, Lala? I mean, she's one of my dearest friends. So I obviously knew that things were not great. And I told her, I support you, but I always say, leave him. <laughs> really? You do? And also, there is some fan speculation, like, that it's some promo for their show or something. Uh, they don't Please. need any help with right, that. Right, right. They're all a hot mess. They don't right. need separations. Right. Okay. <laughs> So I agree with Lola there, right? Because this group of people from the Valley, Vanderpump Rules, all of them combined, right? They're dramatic enough on their own. They probably don't need a separation to get promo for the show. But at the same time, like for Lala to say like, leave him, like, what is it? What is it that he's done where Lala would also agree that she should leave him? So 
I, I am curious to see this start to play out on the show. I mean, there's been so many years where we haven't really gotten to watch Jackson and Brittany's relationship unfold. We haven't really gotten to watch much of their marriage, quite, frank, quite frankly, um, because they ended being on Vanderpump Rules not long after getting married. So, um, you know, we just haven't really gotten to see that. So it definitely will be interesting to see. But um, yeah, I guess we'll just have to sort of have to see where the separation goes. Um, so next on the list, we have Lala is pregnant with her second baby, which is so exciting. She announced this week. Um, so she's going to have a little sibling for Ocean. And she did this through IUI. And I had never heard of this kind of procedure before, but it's basically like a turkey baster situation where she selects a sperm donor. So she doesn't know the sex of the baby yet. Um, but she also mentioned on her Amazon Live, I believe, or sorry, not on her Amazon Live, on... Um, Give them Lala, her podcast, that um, Ariana's best friend um, Meredith is also going through the same process, but she's doing it with her best friend. Um, and she also has a podcast about it, which I've been meaning to listen to myself. But I just absolutely love that Lala is doing it this way. And because what she's been struggling so much with is the co parenting of her daughter with someone who she has no relationship with. And how she doesn't get to be the person that gets to make all of the decisions. Like, I can't even imagine that, right? Like, if you're in a good co-parenting relationship with a co-parent, you know, you're making those decisions together, but they have no relationship, and um, having to give up time, just all of it, right? I mean, there's just so much that goes into having, you know, a split parents, and especially with somebody that she fucking hates, right? So, um her parent, her mom and her brother have been such amazing support systems in her life. Her little pot of orcas, how she says that they, everybody comes in and never leaves and how her mom is going to be her co-parent on this. I just think that is so beautiful because what they're loving about having this baby is that the baby is going to be a hundred percent theirs. They don't have to share the baby with anyone and all of the decisions, all of the memories, all of everything are just going to be with Lala and her family and I just absolutely love that for her because there are so many different ways to make families these days right I mean like she said she's open to love but she's just not open in to sharing a child with somebody again because of what she's been through and it's completely fair and it's completely justifiable and you know even if she doesn't end up finding a man look look at what she has she has a co-parent she has her brother's support she just has so many amazing people around her and it just shows that there are so many different kinds of families right and I love that Okay, so Tom Schwartz has been saying for a little while that he is dating someone, sort of hanging out with someone, not quite dating. He's had all of this stuff, and it's finally come out who it is. So his new little friend named Sophia Scoro, she's 24 years old, posted a TikTok with Tom. And that it pretty much blew up because everyone wanted to know who she was. And, you know, it makes sense uh, for him to date someone young. And I'm not really judging. I just mean, you know, the stage of life he's in where he doesn't feel like despite the fact that he's 40, 42, however old he is now, despite that, I feel like at the end of the day, he's someone who, like he said, is not ready for a relationship right now. So, you know, just someone to hang out with who's someone who's young and doesn't have a lot of um, expectations for him sort of makes a lot of sense, but there's something about her look, and I never, like, talk about people's looks, and I'm not saying anything negative about her looks, but she looks, like, sort of, like, witchy in a sense. Like, I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember the movie The Craft, but she sort of reminds me of the main girl in The Craft, and, like, Neve, Neve Campbell was in that movie. I don't know if anyone remembers it, but, like, Katie was also sort of witchy, so I don't know. There's just, like, a witchiness about her, like, not in a bad way, where, um, you know, maybe he just has a type. Maybe that's what it is. Um, all right, so next on our list is, so Heather Gay had an interview recently where she talks about how body positivity is basically a lie, and she talks about being on Ozempic and how that's changed things for her. So I'm actually just going to play you guys a clip right now from her interview on Nightline about that. Well, welcome to Beauty Lab and Laser. This is the med spa where we say all the best, no BS. After talking to her doctor, she took her first dose of semaglutide, the active ingredient in Ozempic. I didn't want to show up at another party and see all of my friends 20 pounds thinner and just be resentful. So there was almost a pressure there to try it. Absolutely. A pressure and also just maybe a last hope, you know. So what are the key side effects? So nausea is a component of the medications followed by vomiting, potentially constipation. Some people can say that they feel fatigue or tiredness. These drugs can have serious side effects, including risk of thyroid cancer, pancreatitis, and hospitalization. Heather says she's treated differently now, better, 
both on screen and off. What do people start to say? You look great. You look thin. What are you doing? Are you on Ozempic? I started to feel seen for the first time, even after being on television, writing a New York Times bestselling book for the first time. I was being valued by my castmates, by the public in a way that I had never been valued before. And that felt to me sad. Now, I know this sounds bad and I know everyone's against these weight loss drugs and I know everyone is for body positivity and of course I am as well. But I want to explain this sort of coming from somebody who had a similar experience to Heather Gay. So I have always been overweight my entire life. I have tried many different diets, um, including the semaglutides. I've tried Saxenda and Ozempic and Ozempic was the one I was most successful on. I never tried to get skinny on it. I just became like very, very obese and I was just trying to get to a normal place and I'm still, you know, I still struggle from an eating disorder. I've binge eating disorder and I struggle all the time um, with my mentality with it. It is such a psychological sort of disease and, you know, to come to a place where I was comfortable with my body took me years and years and years and a big part of helping with that honestly was the pandemic because we just sort of weren't going out anymore and weren't as consumed with our appearances and that's something I've been able to keep with me since the pandemic thank god to be honest with you because I was yo-yo dieting for years and years and years and I couldn't get the look that I wanted to be at or I couldn't maintain it and it was all I thought about it was all I talked about it consumed my entire life and when I finally got to a place where I could accept my body it was very very freeing However, I did end up going on Ozempic um, to get myself, well, basically what ended up, ha ended up happening was I became so comfortable with my own body that I ended up continuing to just gain and gain and gain and gain weight, which isn't helpful either, which means I'm still at a place where I need to figure out a healthy balance for me and what's going to be, um, you know, realistic going forward. But being on Ozempic or at points in my life where I was thinner, to be honest, I was treated better. And I am treated better now because I am a bit thinner. And it, it has always been that way. No matter how positive I am about my body and how much I can try to do that inside, it doesn't change the way people look at you and the way people treat you. Like, I've had men look me, like, up and down and just made me so uncomfortable with the, with the way they look at my body in sort of, like, a disgust sort of way. And like I said, like you can feel so comfortable with yourself, but when somebody's openly doing that to you, it, it just really kills your self-confidence. And it, it is just a thing in our society, unfortunately, that we are just treated better when we're thin. And it is a very unfortunate thing. And, you know, I still strive to be body positive and I still strive to love myself the way I am, which isn't, you know, perfectly thin and I am still overweight. And I do, um, you know, I am happy with myself like that, but that at the end of the day, if I was a lot skinnier, would I be treated a lot better? Yeah, because I have been in the past. So, you know, I do I do get where Heather is coming from on that sense. I, I'm sorry, but I really do. All right, so last issue of News of the Week, we're going to get into Rachel's lawsuit. So first, I actually just want to... Um, so as we all know, the lawsuit is that she's um, suing Tom and Ariana, and there's four different causes of action, and I'll break that all down. But we all know the basic gist. Um, but first, before we get into the actual lawsuit, I just want to play you guys Lisa Vanderpump's uh, response to the lawsuit. So she was stopped by TMZ reporters at the airport, I think, and this is her response to the lawsuit. Rachel, Raquel, whatever. What do you make about her lawsuit against Tom and Rihanna and Rihanna and, uh, and Ariana for uh, revenge porn, like re recording that, revenge porn and that, sharing it? That's ridiculous. That I, I think if you don't want to have somebody share your porn, then don't send it to your best friend's boyfriend, right? No? Well, she didn't. She, she, it was a FaceTime that she didn't know was being recorded, oh, and then okay. re Tom recorded it against her. Like well, she didn't I know. I have to go. I and then shared, and then he shared it. And Ariana found it and shared it with the castmates. Well, she didn't share it with me. Right. Why does she leave me out? I don't get it. Would you say, at the very least, that's inappropriate behavior? It's all inappropriate. Like, I'm sorry, Lisa, but do you not know the basic tenets of Scandal? <laughs> like, we all know the phone fell out of the pocket. Ariana found the phone. She found the recordings. Tom had recorded Rachel without her consent. This was actually recorded by Bravo, which we will talk about in a little bit. But, like, you're the executive producer of the show. How do you not know the basics of Scandal? Okay. So as I said, last week I read to you guys her entire, Rachel Levis's entire complaint against Tom and Ariana 
and does 1 to 50, which are the potential people that she might be suing if she finds out that um, the videotape of her on FaceTime that was recorded by Tom without her consent where she was masturbating, um, if she finds out that that has been disclosed to other people, that's why it says does 1 to 50, like John Doe 1 to 50. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is break down what her causes of actions are, like what each of them mean. I'm going to break down what she wants, and then I'm going to talk a bit about what I guess I'll call the preamble. So basically like the first, I don't know, like 10 or so pages are basically like context or history that lead up to her causes of action that aren't actually the causes of action. So for example, she talks about issues she has with James, with Lisa Vanderpump, with Bravo, um, with Andy Cohen, and she is not suing any of those people, but I'm going to explain that whole part to you guys after the fact and then give you guys my opinions on that as well. Okay, so this is what she's actually suing for. Okay, so her first cause of action is eavesdropping. Now, the legal definition of eavesdropping refers to the listening in of private conversations and or observing private conduct without obtaining consent from the party being watched. Now, this cause of action is against Tom Sandoval and again, possibly one to 50 others. Um, now, Rachel is saying that she and Sandoval had many private and confidential video calls, some of which were you know, she was naked and engaged in sexual acts. She says that these calls were recorded without her knowledge or consent. And she also says that these were between 2022 and 2023, which again implies more than one video. And now this just violates different privacy rights and laws. Now, this one is pretty easy because this one is just against Tom and the eavesdropping again is him recording her without her consent um, because it is a t California is a two party consent state. So I'm actually just going to play you guys a quick clip from an NBC legal analyst who spoke to this on NBC. Right, and the allegation is that he recorded that video without her consent. Now, in California, it's a two-party consent law. You need that person's explicit consent. So unless he has written or a text message or in the FaceTime video her saying, yes, sure, Tom, you can record this, it's almost guaranteed that he did eavesdrop. That's what wiretapping is. She Okay, so in my opinion, the ways that this could sort of be proven are, first of all, as I mentioned, Bravo has this footage. So that day where cameras picked back up, so this would have been March the 4th, when Tom went to Rachel's house to record with her. Um, during that time, Rachel has said in her lawsuit, and she said it also on Re uh, Bethany's podcast, and we all had sort of heard about it, that she had brought up this issue with him on camera, that he had recorded her without her consent. Um, then he sort of kept insisting that she did give consent. Um, when it was clear that she was not having that, he apologized, gave some sort of sheepish, ap sheepish apology, and said something like, oh, I just wanted to show you how beautiful you looked. Then he freaked out on producers and said if they kept that in, it would be a bad look, and he insisted that they take it out, which they did. Now, I'm still not clear about why. Um, my understanding is I think you can't have someone admitting to committing a crime on camera, and there is an article that I believe Kate Arthur published from Variety recently this week after the lawsuit where she had reached out to Rachel's legal counsel for comment on the fact that that part was taken out of the show and that that's something that Rachel had also wanted. Um, but the lawyer, I believe, did not want to provide comment on that piece of it. But again, regardless, um, as long as Bravo did not destroy that footage, which they shouldn't, and it's being subpoenaed as part of this lawsuit, that's proof right there because we would have his admission. Another way I could think of this could be proven is um, if Rachel still has the text from Ariana where Ariana allegedly sent the FaceTime videos from her phone to Rachel's phone. Then Rachel would see in that FaceTime video that it is her and Tom and that that is a conversation that they had and that he had recorded it without her consent. So this one is a pretty slam dunk one. Um, that's why I definitely think he's going to settle on this one because she has sort of slam dunk information to suggest that he did indeed, did indeed eavesdrop. Okay, so the second cause of action is revenge porn. So the definition of revenge porn legally is often known as non-consensual pornography. It is the uninvited release of sexually explicit photos or recordings of someone. So this one is against Ariana and not against Tom because Rachel is not alleging that Tom um, disclosed the 
FaceTime videos to anyone. She's only alleging that he took the FaceTime video, right? So that's the eavesdropping. But she's alleging that Ariana sent it to people, distributed it to people, and that's the revenge porn piece. Revenge porn is the distribution. So she's also, by the way, also possibly... Um, suing one to 50 other people if there are other people to be found out that this video was distributed to. So as part of Rachel's lawsuit, she alleges that Ariana obtained two sexually explicit videos of her from Tom Sandoval's phone and showed and or sent the videos to herself, Levis, Bravo, Evolution, members of the Vanderpump Rules cast, and to others that Levis is not aware of the names of at this time. She did not consent to Maddox sharing the videos with others. So that is what her cause of action here is. Now, Ariana has said that she has not sent the videos to any other people. Um, we do know, or we believe, because this has sort of become one of those things where all of us Bra Bravo content creators have been searching for this for the past week and can't seem to find it. It's like the Mandela effect. We're like not sure if it happened, but we're 99.9% .9 sure Ariana has confirmed that she sent the videos of Rachel from Tom's phone to her own phone and then sent them to Rachel and then said, you're dead to me. But I can't find any confirmation of Ariana saying that she sent the videos to Rachel. But again, we do have Rachel's confirmation that that happened, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. So Ariana has said that she has not sent them to anyone else. Rachel has made the argument that she believes that they have because there was content within the videos that she believes would only have been known if you had seen the videos. Now, Ariana has confirmed, and I'll play this clip just to, for you guys all to know, and this is from Sheena's podcast, Ariana has confirmed, you know, she only watched like five seconds of the video and it was pretty clear what it was. So in describing it to other people, or maybe she did just describe it to other people, maybe she didn't send it to other people, right? But Rachel is under the impression that it was provided or shown to other people um, based on the content of the video. Again, I find this, a little, this part a little bit confusing. One, Ariana has said that she did not do that. And the second part that's confusing is whether, you know, there was content within this video that would only be known if someone had seen it. I mean, again, she was masturbating, so, like, what else is there? Like, unless somebody comes out and said she was wearing purple eyeshadow and it was very specific, like, I don't know why Rachel is so under the impression that other people have seen this, but she obviously is very, very much under that impression based on this legal filing. And... I don't know for a fact, but obviously, but I would assume that for her to put this in there, she has a very strong belief and maybe even evidence to show that. Um, so I'm just going to play you this clip from Ariana right now showing what she has said about the video. I have not shown I know. or sent that video. I don't have it. Mm -hmm. I did not hold on to it for any reason. It there wasn't was sent to the iCloud. No, so that video was gone, 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 gone mm -hmm. before I ever even called her on the phone. Yeah. And just so everyone knows, I saw about maybe five seconds of that. I wasn't sitting there like <sighs> opening popcorn for right. three nights. So I know that she said that it's like that people know about what's in it. It's very simple. Yeah. I mean, there's you not told I'm not going to get into the details, but there's right. not a lot of details. details. It's very right. straightforward. So it's like I would love to see her name, the people, you know, who have supposedly seen this. Well, that's the thing is it's just like it's really it's really fucked up to try to even. My, well, the other thing is that my lawyer made all of that very clear. The second that she sent when she sent a uh, cease and desist to the entire cast as right. a precaution. Definitely think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I think that's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, totally understand why that would be sent out. Great precaution to take. You should take that precaution. Mm hmm. My lawyer responded to said precaution with very thorough, very clear information mm -hmm. that proved and showed it's like, absolutely not. Here you go. Here's proof. All this stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think regardless of anything, we can all agree if she was recorded without her consent, like that is a big issue. That is a big you issue. Know? And that is something that she should address with him with directly him and leave you alone. Okay, so here Ariana is confirming what happened right after, you know, the incident in question back on March the 1st. Um, and then a few days later, Rachel's lawyers has sent a cease and desist. And so Ariana is saying that basically, you know, she understood it was destroyed. She didn't have it. However, you know, just diving into this a little deeper... Ariana does say, I did not hold on to it for any reason, which implies that she did have it. Now, in looking into the legal implications here, just the fact that she had it at all apparently does count as distribution. So it's not just the fact that she may have sent it to somebody else, which she is saying she has not done, but at its very core, at its very basic level, if she sent it from Tom's phone to herself, that counts as distribution. So I'm actually going to play a clip from um, Behind the Velvet Rope with David Yontif, which is a podcast. And David Yontif is a lawyer where he confirms this. So I'm just going to play this to confirm. Revenge porn. That is the dissemination of the pornography. So by sending it to herself and sending it to Rachel, Ariana has now 
is now liable. Most likely, nobody's liable until, you know, you're not guilty until we prove guilty, but she could be held liable. I mean, that alone is dissemination, sending it to yourself, sending it, sending it to yourself, period. That's dissemination. Sending it to Raquel, that's dissemination. The key with Ariana's, with the key with Raquel's case against Ariana is going to be, where did this go? Where did this go? Did Ariana send it to herself and Raquel and then? So we definitely know that Ariana sent it to herself, and we know that Rachel has said that Ariana then sent the two videos to Rachel, but that is what we don't have evidence of right now. Like I said, we all believe that Ariana has said that she did that, but we don't have, for some reason, um, where that came from. If it was an interview, a podcast, what it is, I can't find her saying that. But as David Yontif said, um, Ariana sending it to herself is distribution and Ariana sending it to Rachel is distribution. The evidence of Ariana sending it to Rachel, the only place I could think of that would be would be on Rachel's phone because if she never blocked Ariana, she would still have the text chain possibly if she didn't delete it between her and Ariana and she would have the text that would show the two videos sent to her from Ariana's phone and then the text that says you're dead to me, right? Um, the other way that this could be uncovered and it could also be uncovered whether Ariana did send this to anybody else is like a forensic um, review of Ariana's phone um, because even if Ariana did keep it well Ariana did say that she held on to it and then got rid of it right so even a forensic review of the phone would show whether she did have it at all whether it was sent to anybody else and when um, I'm just not sure if they're gonna go that level of the investigation because if they end up settling early on, there just may not be that sort of need. But I don't know at this point if Tom or Ariana's phones have been subpoenaed. Okay, um, the other point on this one is that um, Brad, who is best friends with Ariana, he went on the Vile Files in June 2023, and he was also talking about the video. And I'm just going to play that clip now. We're just basically um, like sexting face FaceTime, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um... I haven't seen the video. Nobody has it anymore. But um, yeah, it, it didn't sound good. So just from an investigative standpoint, um, the fact that Brad said nobody has it anymore implies that somebody had it, but not anymore. Now, obviously, he could mean Tom because Tom was the one who took it or Ariana because Ariana, again, has confirmed that she had sent it to Tom's phone from Tom's phone to her own phone at the very least. So that could be what he means. But in an investigation, it would be likely that Brad would be questioned by what he means by that. And so it's very interesting to just to have all the Bravo content creators out there right now pulling all these interviews and pulling all these podcasts and all these quotes because we're actually sort of helping the lawyers because this is the kind of information that they would want to question people on. Okay, so the third cause of action is actually against Tom and Ariana. And this one is invasion of privacy. And as I mentioned, it's also against one to 50 possible other people. So in this third cause of action, Rachel is saying that um, Tom invaded her privacy by recording their private calls and recording sexually ex explicit calls without her knowledge or consent. She alleges that Ariana invaded her privacy by taking the videos and giving them and showing them to others. So she alleges that Sandoval and Maddox should have known that she had the reasonable expectation that she was not being secretly recorded and for such footage should not be sent to or viewed by others. So Sandoval definitely should have had that reasonable expectation meaning like yeah she he should have had the expectation that Rachel should have known that she wasn't been secretly recorded and that should be easy enough to prove just by in terms of the obviousness of it but it may be more difficult to prove that Ariana should have known that Rachel had the reasonable expectation that this wouldn't be shown to others or that it wouldn't be recorded because I mean, in that moment in time, when Ariana took the videos from Tom's phone, she wouldn't have known in that moment that um, Rachel didn't consent to those videos being taken. But regardless, this does, again, all come down to whether or not they were sent to others. Okay, and then the fourth cause of action is intentional affliction of emotional distress. So on this one, she is suing Tom and Ariana and possibly one to 50 others. She says that she has suffered emotional distress as a result of the actions committed by Sandoval and Maddox, including severe emotional distress, physical man manifestations of emotional distress, anxiety, shock, embarrassment, loss of self-esteem, disgrace, humiliation, powerlessness, 
sleeplessness, and loss of enjoyment of life. She alleges that she will continue to be damaged, both like financially, career-wise, all of that, and she alleges that Sandoval and Maddox's acts were at times extreme and outrageous and intended to cause her emotional distress or were done recklessly without thinking about how it would probably cause her emotional distress. So this, this part is going to be harder to prove. I don't know how you prove intentional affliction of emotional distress. I mean, even the fact that she went to um, that rehab place there is evidence where she has said or her family has said that she was going to be going there before Sandov or Scandoval even happened. So I really don't know in that sense. And that one's going to be more difficult. But what does she want? I feel like a lot of you sort of want to know what is she trying to get out of this? So what she is alleging is that Tom and Ariana acted maliciously or in conscious disregard of her privacy. She believes that because of their actions, she's entitled to damages in an amount that will be determined at trial in order to punish them and in order to discourage this from happening again. So that means there is no dollar amount in her lawsuit right now. She is leaving it up to the trial. I believe I've heard it could be up to a billion dollars, but I doubt that. It's probably not likely, but it is odd not to see a number in a lawsuit. Um, normally you do see a dollar amount that's being requested. I don't know why there isn't one being requested in this case, um, but it, it's not completely unheard of. Um, she's also asking for the payment of her legal fees, and she's also asking that Sandoval and Maddox and any others who, if anyone does have this video, to stop distributing it and to delete it. So that's what she's asking for here. And then all of the backstory. So why is that all included? So as I mentioned, there's like a good, you know, majority of it, I want to say like a good like 10 to 15 pages that just seem to be, um, Rachel talking about her history with the cast, her issues with Bravo, or her issues with Andy, or issues with James, and why is that there? And is she suing them? So the answer is that no, she's not suing Bravo, she's not suing Evolution, or James, or Lisa Vanderpump, or Andy, or anyone like that. I have seen this in lawsuits before, and it usually is there to provide context to lead up to the causes of actions that are there. So basically she's providing her historical context of her relationship with the cast to explain how she's led up to the causes of action today. Another reason it could be there, and a couple of legal experts have speculated this, and again we don't know, is that she's sort of laying the groundwork to make a decision to sue Bravo, Evolution, Andy, and whoever else. Because it does sound like in that first chunk that she is very upset with those entities and those are the entities that she wants to sue. Okay, so this whole preliminary piece and this whole area before the causes of action, I'm just going to go over them a little bit just to sort of go over some pieces that I thought were interesting or just sort of stood out or that I had sort of questions about. So, I mean, this whole beginning piece is basically talking about Rachel's entrance to Vanderpump Rules, how she got on the show, pretty much her evolution until her exit from the show. And it does kind of start with explaining, you know, when she made her first appearance, it was as a cast member of, um, it was as a girlfriend, sorry, of the cast member, DJ James Kennedy. And it says here that he was prone to violent outbursts and gra grappling with longstanding substance abuse and emotional dysregulation. Kennedy would regularly berate Levis, falsely accusing her of cheating and act in a generally unhinged manner. Some of this was captured on camera, some was not. Levis eventually warned Kennedy that she would leave him if he did not stop drinking. However, soon sh she soon learned that this despicable behavior was not solely a function of alcohol abuse. At Thanksgiving dinner with Levis's family in Arizona, Kennedy erupted at Levis's mother and father and kicked her family dog four times in an uncontrollable rage. In 2021, Levis ended their relationship and broke off their engagement. So she's saying here that this violent and dangerous behavior was well known by Bravo and Evolution and that the cast has always, and, you know, not just the cast, but Lisa and Bravo Evolution, everybody has always sort of worked to protect James, which is something that we've been hearing, right? I mean, we were talking about how Bethany was bringing up how they're just trying to protect the realm and do this by covering up all this stuff that's going on with James Kennedy. We've talked about all of these abuse allegations against James Kennedy and how there's an internal investigation going on about that. So it is very weird that the show works so hard to cover up for this guy. And when it comes to this dog situation, I mean, now we know the reason that Rachel broke up with him. Um, people have sort of come out of the woodwork saying like, well, you know, she's a known liar. So why would we believe this piece? I mean, I, on this piece, I believe her 100%. I find it odd that we're even debating this because, first of all, she's not suing for this. So there's no really argument to whether we're believing it or not or whether there's proof or not because she's not suing for it, right? But 
There is no reason to lie about it. This was the reason she broke up with him two years ago. This was information that she provided to Sheena, Ariana, Jenny Ting, and Paige at her unengagement party two years ago. Um, and there was a house full of witnesses. And I've been provided information to suggest that it was not just immediate family. There was lots of people there, extended family and friends. So I just want to make the point that, like, we've all lied in our lives. I just want to say this. We've all lied. Everybody has done it in their lives. We have all told a lie. And if everyone in your life refused to ever believe you ever again because of a lie you told, that would suck. <laughs> and that wouldn't really make any sense, right? So I don't know why we're necessarily saying in this respect that because she had an affair and because she lied about the affair and these other things, that she's lying about James kicking her dog two years ago, her family dog again. This is not Graham. This is her family's dog, her family in or Arizona. Um, I, I don't know why it would make sense to lie about that. Um, and, you know, she told her friends this story two years ago, and if they didn't believe her then, I can't imagine them continuing to be friends with her if they believe this to be such an insane lie. And again, remember, we have seen James be violent on the show many, many, many times. So again, let's move on. Um, so then it starts going into how the affair happened, um, how she had started drinking after she broke up with James and she started heavily relying on Sandoval. Um, she discusses how the video was sort of obtained and what happened on March the 1st. Um, but she does say something that ugh, gets a little murky or she says that she believes that even though the affair was purportedly secret, it was in fact well known to many cast members and suspected by others. She wrote that Levis and Sandoval were not particularly discreet. Levis is informed and believes, and on such information and belief alleges, that Maddox knew about it as early as the fall of 2022. Indeed, in December of 2022, Maddox scolded Levis and Sandoval for being handsy in publish, public, admonishing them to save the story for season 11. Now, things like this is what end up, ends up discrediting the entire case right because that something like that just does not seem true and like despite what I just said about you know we all tell lies in our life and I'm not saying that she's lying on this I'm saying that it just doesn't sound right and it must in my opinion I feel like this must have been a miscommunication or a joke on Ariana's part and Ariana has said like she did have a feeling I mean she she obviously didn't know no like I don't believe that she truly knew that they were having a full-on affair but she did even admit in her book that when she saw Tom coming out of uh, Rachel's guest room um, one night when Rachel was sleeping over at their house and he said he was just getting her water that deep down she really knew right so who knows when that even was and um, but regardless when you make a statement like that to flat out basically make a claim that Ariana knew about this affair and as early as that time it just doesn't sound true and then when you say something that doesn't sound true even though that part doesn't relate to what she's actually suing for right like she's not suing Ariana for knowing about the affair it just ends up discrediting the rest of the causes of action which is just something that always happens in legal proceedings right so you see something that you're like okay well that's not true and therefore I don't believe this person on all of the other things which is just sort of what we were saying on the other point right like it's unfortunate that there's some weird things in here that don't appear to be true because it takes away her credibility for the rest of it in my opinion for how the public perceives it um another issue with how the public perceives this is just the fact that she's suing Ariana at all right I mean Tom recording her without her consent is completely fucked up 100% and she should be suing him for that what Ariana did which while we have now received legal information to confirm that if she sent it to herself it is distribution if she sent it to Rachel it is also distribution so at its very core like I said she is liable if those things happened it was Rachel really hurt by them and was you know Ariana has already been through so much and does Rachel really need to do this to her as well? But it wasn't, like I said, like Tom did not commit the revenge porn. It was Ariana. And this wouldn't have even come out if Ariana had not sent the pictures to, or sorry, the videos to Rachel um, from Tom's phone. So it sort of just seems like it follows logically, legally to sue both Tom and Ariana. But it just seems so unfortunate because of all that Ariana has been through to be sued by literally the mistress 
of your ex, right? I mean, and I think that's where she's lost people because people were really starting to come around on her, Um, even myself, right? Like, I was completely the other way. I was completely against her and had planned totally to listen to her podcast this year and make fun of it on my podcast. That was totally my intent. And she turned me around. She made me see things in a different light and she made me see how manipulative Sandoval was. I've also noticed a lot of comments on her um, Apple podcasts, you know, for her, for Rachel Goes Rogue have really turned around. People were really supporting her. But this lawsuit, unfortunately, because she's suing Ariana and because there's things that are within the lawsuit that don't seem true, I think that's where she's lost people. And that's just really unfortunate because people were really starting to come around. I take sketch comedy very seriously, so it offends me when people just think that they can just do it. Okay, so let's get into Summer House. Now, I did not think we were going to so early on in this season get so much of the Carl and Lindsay stuff, but we are. Like, I really thought it was going to be like a slow burn, a slow build up, but they really just jumped in like episode two with it. But, you know, let's sort of go in chronological order. So we're back at the party. They're still having their July 1st party. And Paige is telling Amanda that Kyle was just speaking to her and he was saying how he was afraid to have kids. And Amanda was just, you can see that she's so frustrated. She's just like, fine, like, go be single then. And she tells the camera that she was just born to have children. But she's saying that the business, like their lover boy business, needs to be in a place where Kyle can take a step back and be in his kid's life. So she thinks he's projecting and blaming it on Amanda. And so she was talking about this last week as well. And if this is true, this is really fucked up. And we'll go into this a little bit more later when we get into a little bit more about the relationship. So then we see Danielle again sort of playing her whole, okay, I'm just going to have fun this summer. She starts talking to a guy. She says she's focusing on fun and good for her. Jesse Solomon, I do not know what to think of this man. Like, yeah, he's tall, but like, I don't like the idea that he's hitting on Paige. And he asks Kyle if he only can hit on the single girls. And he says that the best girls have boyfriends, but he's a killer and he can get with girls. So I just find this really annoying. Like, it's a disrespect thing, in my opinion, to continue to hit on someone who you know is in a relationship. And we know that Craig is going to be coming at some point in the summer. So that's almost even worse that he would hit on someone whose boyfriend you're actually going to be meeting at some point. But then again, we also sort of end up having a little bit of a soft spot for him because later on in the episode, he says that he is a two-time cancer survivor, right? And he had just such an amazing perspective on it. He said, like, it really puts your friendships in perspective. It puts your family in perspective. It puts your life in perspective. It does so much. So you really do see him in, like, these two kind of different lights, I guess. And, you know, we've only seen him for a couple of episodes, so I guess we'll have to see or the jury's still out on that one because I haven't decided how I feel about him yet. So then we see Paige and Amanda talking more about Kyle and how, you know, he's saying that Paige isn't ready to have a baby. And Paige tells the camera that if Craig did that to her and said, like, she wasn't ready to have a baby when she thought she was ready to have a baby, she was like, I'm raising you. It's a full time job to raise a man baby. And it's so true, right? Like for for Amanda, that was like a knife in her heart because Amanda is the type of person who not only is just ready to have a baby, she is a person who feels that she's meant to be a mom. So in the morning, we just end up having this fight with Kyle and Amanda. She wants to leave and he calls her cold. And he says that these these fights with them sort of brings him back to summers where he would stay out too late and do all that crazy shit. And he sort of had that guilt and anxiety because he knows what he has in it for him, but this time he doesn't feel like he's done anything wrong. And he said, it's not like confiding in Paige, it's like confiding in someone who isn't already in Amanda's corner. And I do kind of like that. I kind of like that of anyone that he goes to to talk shit about his wife, it's Paige, because at least it's in a safe space, and he's talking to someone who's always going to have his wife's back. So I feel like it's almost the best advice he could get, or the best person he could ever really talk to. Um, Amanda says to Paige that Kyle loves complaining about her to everyone else and it's all those little things that she finds annoying and she gets really emotional and she says like to always be told that you're doing something wrong must be really really hard and so I really feel for her there because I didn't really realize it like for at first she's saying like okay he doesn't feel that she's ready to have kids or she doesn't feel like or he doesn't feel like she works as hard but she's basically saying that he's always kind of coming at her with like, you're not this, you're not this, you're not this. And like to be told by your husband on a constant basis, like all the things that you're not, 
that's got to really cut you to your core. I mean, that person is supposed to be the person who's supposed to be lifting you up and supporting you and telling you how amazing you are. But in actuality, it's like he's bringing her down. And so you can see that she's sort of at a breaking point there. And you can see that they've been having these conversations for a while, just by how emotional she gets when the topic is even brought up about issues between them or about kids. She just sort of leaves or shuts down or just sort of slams it. And I think it's because they've been having this same conversation over and over again. So then we see Gabby talking about how, you know, the past weekend or the weekend that they just had was really good and sol solidified her relationships with the others. Um, and she didn't really get to do that last summer because there was so much going on with like Carl and Lindsay. Um, but now she's like, okay, well, how is next weekend going to be when Carl and, and Lindsay come? Like, what's going to happen? And like, exactly, because I was making fun of Gabby last week when she was on the phone with Carl and Lindsay being like, oh my God, it was the best weekend and we're all here. And despite the fact that we're all here, we're having such a great time and everything's going great. And Carl, Carl and Lindsay are like, yeah, but we're not there. Like, so it was so obvious that they were the problem, but now Gabby definitely sees it. Um, so then we have a scene with Carl and Lindsay and it's kind of sad because you see like Lindsay talking about how they're going to be married in two months and how next summer she might be having a baby. Um, and Carl is finally talking about coming into his own with his confidence and he wants to have a really fun summer and we'll see how that will be to his detriment. Um, Lindsay, talks about hoping for having a better summer with Danielle and she feels really good about where they are. She says that she invited Danielle to their wedding, but Danielle hasn't said anything about it yet. And then we have some of Sierra doing some modeling. She says she's been doing it since she was 16, but New York is a competitive market. And if she doesn't try, you know, she's just got to try. And like this woman is so gorgeous. Like watching her do a photo shoot was just like beyond. She's just like such a beautiful woman. Um, so then we get into like the real meat of the fight between Kyle and Amanda and they go to eat in the city and he apologizes and said he's sorry for the fact that he unleashes on her. And she explains like listing off all the things that bother you about me is what makes me really sad. And he said that a lot of his frustrations are because he's overwhelmed. So that's that's what Amanda was saying, right? That he's taking it out on her. But he explains that, okay, there's the day-to-day, -day, there's the apartment, the bills, the taxes. And he feels like it all falls on him. And she procrastinates a lot. And he feels like, okay, but how are you going to feel when we have kids? You're going to be overwhelmed by that. And Amanda explains, like, when you have kids, like, I won't procrastinate with them. There's it's just not going to be that same kind of thing. But in his mind, he feels like all of the logistics fall on him. Now, in Amanda's mind, she feels like he's actually the one that works all the hours of the day and that how is he going to contribute to a child? But she also believes that he's sort of mixing her work ethic with her ability to do anything else. So we've always known Amanda was a little bit lazy and, you know, Kyle's a workhorse. He works all hours of the day. But for Amanda, like she's just not that person. So she works up into a certain time and that's it. And so he takes that as procrastination and he makes that translate into all aspects of their lives being like well she's not pulling her weight anywhere right um and Kyle's like I'm not gonna like beg you to take on more stuff and Amanda's like I just feel like we need to focus on how we communicate because and she makes a really interesting point here she's like when we fight I go back to square one and I'm paralyzed in my thoughts and I'm not productive but when we sort of talk and we have like that good conversation and it's more in the moment then I feel like I can get shit done so that's sort of interesting because she's basically saying that she, she's agreeing with him in a sense where she's like, okay, here are the ways in which I can lack. However, when I'm lacking and when I'm not productive, it's because of the way we communicate and it's because of the way we fight. So she found a sort of bigger problem to the problem, right? Which it always is. It's not about the taxes or the bills of the apartment or who's going to do what. It's the bigger issue of the communication. And if they can learn to communicate better, I mean... Think about how long they've been together and they've been through different stages of life together, right? Like Amanda has been with him since she was in her early 20s and she's like 30 now, he's 40 now. So, you know, we all change throughout our lives and you have to either, you either change together as a couple or you don't. You either grow together as a couple or you don't. But as you go through your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, you do change a bit as a person, including your communication style. And especially how Amanda was during the pandemic or even the last few years of what she's preferred to do. She prefers to stay home and chill out with the dogs and, you know, just stay home and watch TV. And that's who she is. So, like, Kyle needs to either communicate to her that that's, um, you know, there's parts of that style that doesn't work for him. And that's how they're going to get through this. But he can't make comments to her about her ability to parent based on her work ethic or her procrastination about other things around the house because it just doesn't translate that way and it is just so so offensive to a woman to have a man tell her that she wouldn't be good as a kid basically right now right um 
So then Lindsay and Carl get to the house. So this is the next weekend and it's our first weekend with Lindsay and Carl. And it basically goes to shit from immediately, basically. So Lindsay starts by telling the camera she's nervous because of last summer and she doesn't want to have conflict because Carl doesn't like conflict, she says. Carl doesn't like conflict. Okay. Um, so when they get there, West offers his room to Lindsay. This part is confusing. So he's like, I want to give you guys the room, um, but my only request is the fan because, you know, it's just what I need to sleep. And Lindsay's like, well, it's the hottest room in the house. And well, you know, I need one with a bathroom. And so she's being so passive aggressive, but West is like actually her friend. Like she brought him into this house. She brought him into this friend group. So it's kind of weird that she's being so passive aggressive. And again, like, you know, I mean, this is the rule of any sort of house. If you're coming in second weekend, third weekend, whatever this is, you don't get first picks of the room. It was actually really nice of Wes to do that. And she's already just giving him attitude. So you can see that, you know, Lindsay is already just in a bad mood. So then here's basically what happens. So the gang goes out to a club after dinner. An hour after going out for dinner, Gabby and Lindsay come home. And Lindsay says that on the way to the club, she was in the car with the boys and she was worried it would be used against her that she rode with the boys and not the girls. And she was in the car with, I believe, Carl, Kyle, and Jesse. So Carl tells her like, you know, like I totally understand what you're saying, but I don't think you need to be worried about that. And then Lindsay got upset that she felt that he was shutting down her feelings and dismissing her. And then Carl said that she got in his face and said, what are you on? And Kyle said that Lindsay went from zero to a hundred and Jesse said that it totally came out of nowhere. Now, to ask a sober person, what are you on, when you yourself, Lindsay, are not sober, is really, really fucked up. Also, it's really dismissive and detrimental to someone's sobriety to question their sobriety, especially when they're being completely fucking normal. And we've seen Lindsay do things like this before. We saw her last summer where, like, she picked a fight with him about how he responded to Danielle and he was very calm with her, but she kept getting in his face to the point where he actually drove all the way fucking back to New York from the Hamptons in the middle of the night, right? So this is, we've totally seen Lindsay go from zero to 100. So then Gabby said that Lindsay was upset as soon as they got to the club. And Lindsay told her that, and told Amanda and Gabby that he was on something and that he was really mean to her and that she swears that he's on something. Like she said this a million times on camera. She repeats it to Gabby, he's on something. So then she calls Carl and he says he's on the way home and he says, thank you for checking. And he sounds completely calm and normal. And Gabby actually says, like, that sounds like a sober man to me. And then Carl texts the following to Lindsay. OK, I've quoted this. Happy to have the same conversation we have tonight, tomorrow morning. Perhaps a good night's sleep will allow us to listen to each other and have a convo about what your experience was and what mine was. And she wrote, let me know when you're sober. What the fuck, Lindsay? Like, he has the most calm collected convert like text to her saying like i'm happy to talk about these differences and experiences after she literally just called him basically a drug addict or asking or telling him like he's you know like fallen off the wagon and then he has this very calm text to her and she still continues to come at him it's like she's clearly intoxicated and so someone who's drunk shouldn't be speaking on somebody else's sobriety and carl says like it's beyond hurtful and fucked up and he's like that's the person i'm supposed to marry and it's just nuts because, again, this is episode two, right? We were told that, like, we're going to see their downfall throughout the summer by other cast members. And we heard from Lindsay, they were totally good all summer up until the past, or sorry, up until the last two weeks of summer. But according to this, this starts right at the fucking get go. And I cannot believe that she would say something like this. Now, you want to give her the benefit of the doubt and think, OK, maybe she was really, really drunk. And in the morning, she will see the light. But in the morning, she fucking doubles down. And she says, you were treating me like shit last night. And she was like, what did you mean when you texted me? I am sober right now. What did you mean by right now? And he's like, I am sober. I'm a sober person. And he said, like, Lindsay, you're just taking things out on me. And he's like, I'm trying to talk to you about and I'm trying to, like, fix it. I had a different experience than you. And she's like, you're incapable of understanding my experiences. And she, he's like, yeah, I am. <laughs> right. Because her experience isn't making any sense. And so she questions him again about being sober. And he's like, you drink all day long and are rude and aggressive when I'm trying to be supportive. And she shuts him down and and then she basically calls him an asshole and he leaves and it's like you know we were before when we heard that their relationship had broken up we were so hard on carl and we thought we cannot believe that carl called the cameras to come and watch them do their breakup and carl's the enemy and carl is terrible but seeing this so early on it is 
disgusting to, I mean, I just can't even say any more. That's also a person that you love. That's the person that you want to marry. That's the person that you love the most. And you're like, what do you want? What do you want? That is so gross. That is so disgusting. If I didn't have my partner's support and they're questioning my sobriety whenever I speak, I mean, that's, it's just so disgusting. And it's so clear that these two people are not meant to be together. Um, But that is it for the Summer House recap of the week. He's a f***ing battered wife! Look at him! Okay, so let's get into our Vanderpump Rules recap of the week. So we are back in Tahoe, still in Tahoe. Feel like we've been here for three weeks now, but not quite sure. Um, We have a scene of Sheena and Lala talking about how Sheena's struggling about Tom, and she's like bawling her eyes out, and she's like, she's Team Ariana, and knows that she can't be friends with him again. But apparently in the pandemic, Tom gave her money because she had nothing coming in. So I didn't know this, but she said that her podcast was apparently canceled for a period of time. I don't really know why. I wasn't even listening to it back then, so I didn't know that. So she had no income because the show also wasn't on during the pandemic. Um, So she had no income coming in and she was pregnant and he had sent her like thousands of dollars. And so she said she's struggling not to forgive someone who has been there for her. And I feel I really feel like Lala has been such a great listener and such a great friend to Sheena this season. She's really acted as sort of like a sounding board. And I feel like that's sort of her role this season because she's really there to tell, you know, Sheena how much her feelings are valid. Now I'm not gonna go into too much of this Sheena Lala thing right now or Sheena and Tom thing right now because that's sort of what the whole episode is about and we'll get to it later. Um, But then we have, you know, Ariana at her book photo shoot and we saw the beautiful picture she was taking. She talks about how her last book was with Tom, but this is her breakup album. Um, And then we're back in Tahoe and Tom has that meditation teacher come and she's supposed to teach meditation and I guess some yoga. And so he explains to her that basically the group is like rifted because he had an affair and the the woman that who's leading it like she's trying so hard like not to have any facial expression as he explains how his affair caused this rift in the group um so they basically do all of these sort of different guided meditations and there's this one where they have to sit back to back and sheena is paired with tom and she doesn't want to be it was like this whole thing where brock was sitting with other people and she is just ready to explode she says she's holding on to so much anger and she isn't ready to meditate and breathe together And she can't handle it. She's like back to back with Tom and she's like bawling, like holding in her tears so bad. And she's like, I can't handle it. She ends up crying and getting up and walking away. And she's like, I still fucking hate you to Tom. And then Brock ends up following her. And he's like, look, like I paired myself with James and Allie because like, he's like, I wanted Sheena to work through things. So he ends up getting Sheena to come back. And the meditation teacher has them go face to face. And she says, imagine this is the last time you would ever see this person and like to feel that. And Sheena tells him that she knows she needs to let go of the hate because it's not good for her, but she feels like she doesn't know him anymore. And she also feels like he did this. He's the one that did this to her. Sheena said that she could see there's a soul inside him and that he misses her in their friendship and that he knows how badly he fucked up. And she says she could see like real tears from him this time. So this was like a pretty emotional moment um, for Sheena and I think what people, I mean, we all love to come at Sheena for, you know, her flip floppiness um, and especially on this. But, you know, this scene is so interesting because would this scene even be happening? Would this trip even be happening if it wasn't for the show? Like, no. Right. Like at this point in time, three months after the affair, would Sheena really be going on vacation with Tom and talking to him about her feelings? Like, no. So she's being so forced into it. If you really think about it at this really short interval of time when she has just ended their friendship right um so then we have lala going to talk to sheena and sheena's like bawling her eyes out saying that she you know had texted ariana and said that she always has her back and lala's like okay but like you know at some point we can't punish him forever like there's nothing we can do to change what happened and it's so obvious here that sheena wants him in her life and she just doesn't know how to have both him and ariana and she can't right because like ariana has said that like i'm not gonna have anyone in my life who's mutual friends with him and you can just see the struggle that she's having basically is not this internal struggle to let him go or not this internal struggle even to forgive him because i feel like she can do those things i feel like her internal struggle is with just wanting to be his friend she just wants him in her life and she's trying to figure out how to do that and she can't do that and it's it's killing her inside it's absolutely killing her and that's why she just keeps end up word vomiting to ariana which we'll get to a bit later so now we're back in tahoe uh everyone's on a gondola and tom tom and brock are on one together and brock says that sheena doesn't know how to handle the relationship with sandoval right now and sandoval says that with sheena being diagnosed with ocd that makes a lot of sense to him because she's fixating so much on this thing with him and Rachel. And I find that such a fucking offensive thing to say. Like, 
she's fixating on it just like the rest of the world was. It was fucking Scandival, and because those were two best friends in her life, of course she's fucking fixating on it. It has nothing to do with her OCD. I think that's extremely rude. Um, and then he says, but at the end of the day, and he keeps making this point, that what he and Rachel did wasn't malicious, but what Sheena did was. Okay, I love how he keeps saying that what he and Rachel did wasn't malicious, when, like, there was a point in time where he had sent a text to a friend where he was calling her Rachel, or sorry, he was calling Rachel Jamie in his phone, and he had texted the friend saying, oh, took Jamie to the Mile High Club tonight. Like, how can you send texts like that, but not be doing something malicious. You were doing something fucked up behind Ariana's back. It was malicious. And if Sheena was doing something malicious as well by the podcast, I mean, again, deserved at that point in time. So then the boys are basically fighting and Brock is like, okay, well, your girl put a restraining order on my girl. And Tom is like, yeah, because Sheena punched her in the goddamn face. And Brock is like, he just isn't taking accountability. And then Brock goes into the whole thing where he says that Sandoval's team was pushing rumors about Brock and Raquel together. And Sandoval is saying that he didn't do that. And he literally will take a polygraph. And he kept saying that, like, the podcast thing, he just kept feeling like he was being kicked while he was down. And Brock does end up saying, okay, you know, we may have gone over it a little bit too much with the podcast. And Sandoval does, you know, end up apologizing a bit as well. And who knew that Brock was going to be the peacemaker? Like, in this very fucked up situation, he seems to be the best one to sort of... I don't want to say get the group together, but just sort of get all the relationships on the same page in order to get through certain events. That's just sort of what it seems like. Um, so then we see Sheena calling um, Ariana and Katie from the boat. So after they go in the gondola, they go in the boat and um, Ariana and Sheena are uh, interviewing people for something about her. And so when Sheena calls, Ariana's like, you know, she can see that Sheena's so upset and she was crying and she was explaining how she had to do that whole meditation thing with Tom and how hard it's been on her and she's just completely losing it. I mean, basically on this entire trip, Sheena is bawling the entire time. And Ariana's like, you know, I want you to heal, like I want that for you. But you putting yourself in a position to be friends with someone that would do this to you is not someone I want for you to be friends with for you. And Sheena's like, yeah, like we'll never be what we used to be and it was a really heavy loss for her. And she says that she feels like she, for the first time, caught genuine tears from him um, and not performative ones, but she feels like she leads to let go of the hatred because she can't keep hating him for her. And you can see that that is what Sheena is doing, right? She basically is admitting it here. I am only hating you, or I am only hating Tom for you, Ariana. I want to do this for you. And even just the way Sheena was acting on the podcast or acting just in general with this whole thing, she was very Team Ariana. She was to her core Team Ariana, but she was also sort of taking actions we wouldn't expect of her, like by being mean on podcasts and, and that kind of thing, right? Ariana was going hard, or sorry, Sheena was going very hard for Ariana. Not that Ariana had ever asked for that, she didn't. But, you know, Sheena was doing something that is not very Sheena. Sheena is not the type of person who likes to go hard at someone in a negative way, and she was going really hard at Sandoval and Rachel, and I think it was just really taking a toll on her, and it's really killing her. But it's showing that she hates doing that, and that she doesn't want to hate him anymore, and she's only doing that for Ariana. But you can't hate him for Ariana. You need to hate him for yourself, or you need to like him for yourself. You can't hate him on her behalf. That's just not conducive, and that's exactly why she's blowing up like this, right? Um, so then Lala and Sandoval end up having a talk and on the boat, and, you know, so she's her question to him is, like, how could you look me in the eyes and come at me for not being real? Because he's always saying that she's not real, that she doesn't put herself on the show, she put enough of her life on the show, when he knew what he was doing, right? He was having this affair. And his only argument was that, like, his affair was shorter, and Lola's relationship was, like, a secret for years, and they end up just, like, yelling at each other. It's, like, this whole fight, and he's, like, he's saying about how everyone puts themselves out there but her, which, like, why is that even his problem? Like, I don't know why he always cared about that so much. Like, if the show had an issue with it, they would fire her, but obviously they felt she had enough of a storyline without it, so I don't know why he would always come at her so hard, but he was, like telling the cameras that like, okay, fine, like, yeah, I had an affair and I lied about it and she had her thing and she lied about it. So we're both liars. So can't we both call this a wash? And I kind of do agree with him there, right? But you know, it, at the end of the day, she wants, like, 
an apology. And so she's saying, like, you know, he doesn't get to tell her about the past that she lived, which is that thing that he does. He's just going on and on about her past and how she didn't do this and didn't do that and didn't disclose this and didn't disclose that. And she's like, you still haven't said you're sorry. And this really felt like a housewives type fight because it was really just a, a conversation about, like, you said something that offended me because you're a hypocrite and therefore I just want a sorry. And that is just the most housewives thing that I've ever seen. So she ends up freaking out and she's like, am I going crazy? Like, how come all he can talk about is the past? And he's like, you went so hard at Raquel and only after you got eaten alive on social media were you like, mm, maybe I went a little hard on her. And Lala's like, no, it wasn't that. What triggered me is when she said, if I don't have Sandoval or if I don't get in line with Sandoval, I don't have anyone. And then she accuses him of isolating her and grooming her. He's like, I didn't fucking groom her. And this just goes on. And this was, this was a really interesting scene. I mean, to accuse him of grooming her, I mean, when I really think about it, I don't think he intentionally groomed her like some people do. I think it sort of turned into that because there was definitely elements of manipulation. There was definitely elements where, you know, he's saying even in that last five minutes, right? Um, when she ended up talking about that on her podcast, um, that she had talked about that with her therapist and how um, Tom had said to her, like, you know, you really betrayed me there. And if you ever betray my trust again, like, I can't be with you. And that was such a gaslighty, manipulating thing to do because her therapist explained to her, but he is the one that betrayed you for this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason being he made you continue to lie. He made you do this and he filmed you without your consent, right? For all of those reasons. So in my opinion, he did sort of start to groom her at the end to believe all of his lies and to follow what he was doing and to believe his truth and to get him on her side. Because if you look at all the things he did to her throughout that period of time, and if you listen to her podcast and you listen to, you know, him trying to manipulate her into leaving the meadows when she didn't feel safe to do so. I mean, you know, all of these things are grooming types of behavior, but I don't think he went into it with that intent. Um, so Lala and him end up, you know, figuring it out. He apologizes, she apologizes, they hug. And... What's interesting about this is like, they really don't need to have this fight because they're not friends, right? But this fight is happening and this common ground needs to happen for them to continue to maintain a show together. But again, like, why are they on a show together when they're not friends, right? Like all of these fights just seem sort of pointless when these two people really have no relationship with each other. Um, so then we have a scene of Lala and Sheena talking. And so basically Sheena's upset because I think we all remember this. So last summer when the group was in Tahoe, they went out one night and a, um, a fan saw them and asked for a group photo and Sheena was standing next to Sandoval in the photo. And then people online started going crazy. And there was this page six article coming out calling Sheena fake and saying that she wasn't team Ariana and she wasn't a good friend. So in this scene, like Lala and Sheena are talking about it and Sheena's so upset, crying again. And Lala's just been amazing. And she's like, you know, has Ariana come to your defense at all, Sheena? And Sheena's like, no, of course not. And Sheena's just, she's like, I'm tired. And you can see she's physically tired, not just physically but like emotionally too she's so drained and she says that when she tries to talk to ariana and say that she's struggling ariana dismisses it or tells her that she shouldn't feel this way because he's a bad person and ariana's amazing or sorry lala's amazing because she's like your feelings are absolutely valid and the thing here is though you know and i do think sheena's feelings are valid but i think at the end of the day what needs to happen here is sheena should not be expressing these feelings to ariana you know, I was in a similar situation where I was dating someone who um, we didn't have any mutual friends at the end of it except for one, and that was both of our best friends. So I didn't want to stop being friends with her because she was my best friend. He didn't want to stop being friends with her because that was his best friend. But having that one mutual tie was really, really hard on me because every time she brought him up, it just sort of brought back like old feelings for me, and it was just like really, really hard. And I just didn't want to hear about him, right? And neither does Ariana. She wants to move on. So I feel like Sheena has many friends, as we know. Sheena has 400 best friends. So I just don't think it's actually productive or conducive or even fair for her to express this to Ariana. I think her feelings are valid. I think her struggle is valid right now. But I think Ariana is not the friend she should be talking to about this. I think that that's really unfair. So then Sheena says that Ariana knew how badly Sheena wanted Dancing with the Stars, but Sheena was so happy for Ariana when she got it. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, this whole scene is sort of funny. Like, I did not know Sheena wanted Dancing with the Stars. I also don't think Sheena would last very long on Dancing with the Stars. She would get hurt. She would get emotional. And Ariana, like, fucking killed it. She was so amazing at it. But anyway, so Lala ends up saying, like, you know, your feelings are totally valid. And she's like, you know what? It's time for Ariana to pull her head out of her ass and remember who her friends are and what they've done for her. And Sheena says that she's tired of it only being about Ariana and for her not 
to be able to allow to be allowed to feel anything and oh wow that was a harsh line from Lala right I mean I think that Ariana remembers who her friends are but in terms of what they've done for her again Ariana never actually asked Sheena and Lala to go so hard at Tom for her or to come at him on podcast or to do any of that to my knowledge right so I think maybe there's an unrealistic expectation that Ariana owes her friend something for standing behind her, right? So that's the end of the episode, and then we get into the VPR after show. So in the after show, Sheena is basically saying that Katie and Ariana aren't her audience when Sandoval is involved. And yeah, that's like what I was saying, right? She said like she felt like she could open up to them because she's close to them, but that made her feel immediately stupid. And she doesn't feel like they care because it's not about her. Um... Yeah, I mean, Sheena, or sorry, Katie and Ariana are two people who hate Sandoval, so yeah, they are not your audience for this, and those aren't the people that you should be talking to about Sandoval. And then we have Katie saying that she doesn't understand being upset about a person that doesn't really exist, and by that I think she means, you know, you never really knew who he was, so she doesn't understand why Sheena was upset about Sandoval because you never really knew him. She says that Sandoval made the choice easy for her, and she says that Katie is or sorry katie says that sheena is a male sympathizer she says that she seeks out male validation and she gives the example of when like she and schwartz were breaking up that you know that was a point in time where sheena was like feeling very bad for schwartz and she was best friends with schwartz and she had to be there for schwartz and everything was about like making sure schwartz was okay and you know i definitely do see that um that's very interesting but i really don't know i don't know i just don't know where Sheena's friendships with Katie and Ariana lie after these series of episodes come out and these after shows because it really does seem like there is resentment between Ariana towards Sheena and maybe even towards um from Katie towards Sheena as well um Ariana said that she doesn't need to be the one to co-sign it whether they're friends and that's true um James says she understands why Ariana wouldn't want to hear it (laughs) as we all would um and Lala is saying that the thing is that no one is acknowledging that Sheena's feelings are valid, which is true. And I love, again, that Lala is there for her in that role. She has that support system in Lala. Then we have Tom saying that he sent Sheena money during the pandemic because she was struggling and because he was her friend. Um, Katie says it actually doesn't speak to someone's character. She says that it doesn't outweigh the other damage. And then Ariana says, like, it seems like Sheena feels like she owes Tom because he gave her money. And Katie says, like, he likes to do that to make himself feel good. And Tom says, it's not about buying people's loyalty. And, you know, he says that he does it just because he really cares about people. Sheena talks about how it was actually Tom's publicist who no longer works with him, who was the one putting out stories about Raquel and Brock, trying to deflect from Tom and Raquel. And he's certain of that. Tom says he would never do that. Sheena says that she knows from people in the, in the industry that it was his team. Uh, Schwartz said that Brock had told him that it actually put a real strain on their family. And Sheena said it made her really think. And of course, she ended up questioning him. Lala says that she's been trying to be softer this season. But, you know, with Tom, he sort of kept doing the same shit. He accused her of not being real and not putting her life out there. And then Sandoval said that there are times where we keep things in our lives hidden, but Lala had kept her life hidden for years. He said that Lala only brought up him staying at a party, for example, with Raquel to be salacious. And when, you know, that was on season 10, when she goes up to Ariana to ask, like, why he didn't come home when her grandmother had died. But I do truly believe she was asking with real intent. I truly do believe that she does love Ariana deep down. Um, Lala saying that, you know, all she was asking from him was to say sorry, and he still couldn't do that because he's a narcissist. And Lala was saying that she was happy that Sheena had stepped in for her in that moment when they were on the boat. She was able to disarm him and get him to see what she was saying. Um, she was saying that, you know, he was going off about her not being real when he was having an affair. And Lala says that at the end of the day, they ended up on the same page, which they've never been before. Um, And then you have Sheena talking a little bit about the meditation and she says that it was really hard on her because of not just Sandoval but also things that were going on at home and things that were going on in her head and she was so mad at him for so many things but now she was sort of like who the fuck are you and she said for the first time she saw genuine emotion from him and not performative tears. So that was the end of the after show and that's the end of the episode for this week you guys so thank you so much for listening. Um, You can listen to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon or wherever you get your podcasts. 
You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel at I Take Bravo Very Seriously. You can follow me on TikTok at The Bravo Investigator. You can also follow me on Instagram at The Bravo Investigator and at I Take Bravo Very Seriously. And please, guys, if you wouldn't mind, if you like the show, please leave a five-star review. And until next time, keep taking Bravo very seriously.